Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's monthly webinar series. Today's topic is going to be Cable Fault Location 202 Advanced Techniques. My name is Sarah Bauman, and I'm the Marketing Programs Manager for Megger North America. I'll be acting as your moderator for today's presentation. I'll be supporting all of you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you should see a control panel that looks similar to this one, and you could submit questions there at any time during the presentation. Just type in the box highlighted in red, and then I'll read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. All webinar attendees for this particular webinar will receive one PDH or .1 CEU for attending. You'll receive this in an email within two business days after the webinar. That email will also include a copy of the PowerPoint presentation from today, as well as a link to the recorded webinar. So if you want to watch it online, you can do it then with your colleagues. And please remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, and they'll be answered after the webinar ends. Our presenter today is Robert Probst. He's an applications engineer for Megger's technical support group. He also specializes in cable. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Robert. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I hope everybody is awake and ready for this. Um, uh, so here we go. On the agenda today is pretty much everything that we couldn't cover last year in the Cable Fault Location 101, which heavily focused on the arc reflection method and pretty much the basic method. So this is particular uh, for all the methods that we couldn't cover last year. If you think that you need more detail or um, a little bit more than a quick refresh on uh, ARM, on the ARC reflection method, you can find the webinar in last re year's recording. And it's, I think it's called A Quick Guide to Cable Fault Location, which is pretty much Cable Fault Location 101. So first of all, we will talk a little bit about the faults because these methods that we're talking about today um, are highly determined by the type of fault that you're trying to locate on. Initially, I will do a quick refresh on the arc reflection method so everybody's at the same page here. And uh, then we will talk a little bit about the challenges uh, when fault locating on PILC, because there's still a lot of PILC cable out there uh, in, the, in the big cities uh, all around the United States, specifically the, the coast. Uh, the coastal areas, downtown networks. And um, then we will talk specifically about the so-called transient methods. Then very, very briefly about uh, using a bridge. And then I will just quickly summarize and uh, we will go into the Q&A session. So when we're talking about faults, uh, you can think about two categories pretty much. One you can call the flash over faults, and uh, the other category is faults that do not flash over. Within the group of the flash over faults, you have two distinct voltage ranges you can fault locate in. The uh, very typical range is that the fault ignites, or let's say the breakdown voltage of the fault is 32 kV or less. And the other class of faults is if the fault ignites above 32 kV. Then for, um, this is why I put the low resistance box here, on the lower end of the faults that ignite below 32 kV, you can have faults that have a fairly low resistance, but you can still spark them, you can still initiate an arc. And then you have low resistance faults that are like really, really low resistance and they don't produce any flesh overs anymore. This is why this uh, category is, uh, you know, halfway in the flesh over, halfway in the, in the no flesh over faults. And then the blue box pretty much is more or less just a technique that can be applied to a, uh, a certain extent to uh, alter the characteristics of your fault. And uh, we will talk about one specific method here um, uh, later in the presentation. So now uh, on the next slides, we will pretty much go through these uh, classes of faults. 
in general, when we're talking cable fault location systems, um, you will see variations of this slide a lot during this presentation. Uh, you have various components in your cable fault location system, and in principle, it's always those three components that you see on the left, while the cable is always there. This is like your, your test object, your the, the cable you are fault locating on. Um, and it depends on the equipment. If these components are integrated, so you just see pretty much as a user one enclosure, or of these components are separated into three or two different uh, in, uh, boxes, so to speak, pieces of equipment. You will always have, for any cable fault location, a high voltage source. Then on modern fault location equipment, you will have a TDR and a separation device. This is kind of a general um, uh, name for that because there's different separation devices. They all like have the, a similar function, but they're not the same. So I just categorized everything under separation device. Now, the big difference also between old school uh, cable fault location systems and uh, more modern systems is that back in the days, let's say in the 70s or still, you know, uh, until the 80s, um, specifically in the North American market, the separation device and the time domain reflectometer was not there. So you would just connect your thumper or your cable fault location system directly to the cable and start fault location. Um, so keep that in mind. We have a high voltage source, a separation device of some sort, and a, a measurement or recording device, which is in this case uh, is the radar or TDR. Now, first category, how do you fault locate if you have a flash over fault and you are below 32 kV? In general comment, uh, for general comments, why 32 kV? This is something that is kind of a, was a natural development. 32 kV is typically the highest voltage you can find in commonly available thumper equipment for, ser for direct searching, for, for uh, thumping. So, the capacitor discharge that is built in, uh, into those systems is typically 32 kV. Below 32 kV, the uh, main method, the industry standard for many decades now is the so-called arc reflection method. However, the arc reflection method can have problems, uh, can be challenged by um, the fault you're trying to locate. So what are you doing if you cannot use the arc reflection method? This is pretty much what this uh, uh, webinar and the presentation is circling around. So keep that in mind. The class below 32 kV is typically handled with classic commonly available surge wave generators and a capacitor discharge method of some sort. So now the quick uh, uh, refresh on the arc reflection method. To do that, I have to talk about the TDR very quickly. So this is very compressed. As I said, if you need a little bit, you know, a more of a decompressed presentation, there, there's this webinar last year specifically targeting this. Now, the TDR is in principle like a radar. This is why a lot of people just call it a radar. It works, as the name says, in the time domain. This is very important because its measurements and whatever it is doing, its function, it's just based on run times of pulses. It sends out pulses of a certain uh, uh, shape and any distance is only calculated. So it technically measures times. Uh, its resolution limit is typically uh, faults that are let's say around 300, maybe 400 ohms and less. So if you have a, a fault, a higher resistance fault that is, let's say, a few kilo ohms in resistance, the TDR will not be able to um, indicate this on the trace. The main uh, principle of the TDR is based on having two parallel conductors. This is actually very important because as soon as you lose one of the two, like, however this happened, let's say, uh, 
uh, severed conductor or cable end, whatever, if at least one of the two ends, the, uh, the pulse cannot propagate any further and will suffer typically total reflection. Modern TDRs visualize uh, the impedance measurement because this is in, in essence what you're doing. The impedance footprint that you take of the cable, they visualize this as a waveform. And there's a few, um, let's call it key signatures for these impedance changes or impedance mismatches. So if you don't have any change, that means your typical cable, it's a concentric construction, symmetrical, and the distance between the center conductor and the uh, shield should not change. So you expect to see a flat line or an almost flat line because there's no impedance change. Um, the one extreme case would be the open end of the cable or you know, if one of the two conductors just stops and the pulse cannot propagate any further. So you have a very high impedance situation or an open, so you will see an upward slope on the trace. Like, you, like it is indicated on the right there. And the other extreme would be a very low impedance situation, which would be, a, in, in the extreme case would be a short, which is a downward slope, a very distinct V-shape, if you want to, if you want to uh, call it like this. And then you have like something in between, um, high to low, low to high, and so forth. So you have transitions or any other type of mismatches, connections, for instance, uh, um, or you go from an overhead line to a uh, cable or from a cable to an overhead line, these uh, points. And then you see a kind of sideways S shape and uh, a typical indication for, let's say, on a trace uh, for a splice or for in URD loops, Y grounded single space transformers have the same signature as a splice just more pronounced because the distance change, the impedance change between the two conductors is larger than just on the splice. And so if you have very low resistance faults, you can always hook up the radar and use the TDR and, and hope you will find a short or a low impedance situation without even turning on any high voltage. Also very effective with the TDR is always, which is kind of a basic method, I just want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, repeat on that a little bit is the phase comparison method. If you have three conductors or three phases, you can always take three measurements. Let's let's say if you have A, B, C, you can take a measurement A to B, B to C, C to A, and by comparison, you can also find uh, which uh, phase is faulted. Now, a real-world trace on a TDR would look something like this. So initially, on the on the left. You have your connection mismatch or the characteristic hookup impedance that is always there. Uh, as you can see, it's a fairly nice flat line and you see the open end is this upward slope at, at the end of the cable and the algorithm here flagged it and um, uh, calculated the distance and approximately uh, one third down the trace, you can see this uh, uh, very faint sideways S that would be a splice in that cable. So this is a typical real world trace that you're seeing here. So now our reflection method is a two-step process and you pretty much are overlaying two traces. You use this trace that you just saw, this one, which is your uh, reference trace, it's called the reference trace. And uh, because the, the TDR can identify very high impedance situations like opens and very low impedance situations, uh, but it's, it's blind, as I said, for the high resistance faults. Um, and this has also to do because the TDR, as I said, is a pure uh, low voltage uh, measurement, 35 volts or something. Some, some TDRs have more 50 or up to 160. Um, so that measurement is blind for high resistance faults. Now what can you do? You use the thumper in conjunction with the radar to record a second trace to create a so-called fault trace. And then the software in the TDR is overlaying the two traces. And where the two traces separate, 
and where you see on the fault traits the very pronounced V shape, this is where your fault position is. Why is that the case? When the uh, thumper is charged up and discharged into the cable, um, the insulation is not compromised anywhere else than the fault position. So that high uh, voltage wave pulse travels down the cable and so the fault trace would uh, be pretty much on top of the reference trace all the way until the fault position. Now where the, the pinhole fault or the high resistance fault is, the voltage now is enough to uh, break down that fault right there. And now you create a very low impedance situation. So you change the impedance actually at that point because now you have a bridge between the center conductor and the shield. There's an arc burning. And uh, the TDR will be triggered in a way to exactly hit that moment in time when this uh, arc is happening and is recording the second trace. Now, because the uh, radar is in a so-called active mode, it is actively pulsing, it needs to be coupled on the cable, like on the thumper, by a filter. That filter also has a, an, a few other functions. It's also shaping the energy in a way to maximize arcing time. So the radar has a maximum time frame to actually hit that fault trace. And in terms of equipment, back to our slide, our high voltage source now is the capacitor discharge, 32 kV max. You have the filter and the, the TDR is active. So the, uh, the cap discharge is happening through the filter into the cable. The TDR is sending out the measurement pulses and is measuring the uh, reflections. What will you actually see on the screen as a user? We have our cable here. There is a fault somewhere. Uh, the end where you are connected at is called the near end. The other end is the far end. Now you take your low voltage uh, measurement, so which is the, the reference trace. You see the characteristic hookup impedance and you see the open end, but you don't see the pinhole fault there. So now you charge up your capacitor, you discharge it into the cable, you trigger the radar, you overlay the two traces that you get, and at the fault position, you will see a breakaway of the red trace from the blue trace and a very pronounced V-shape. This is your fault location, and now you calculate the distance by having measured the time and by using the so-called cable velocity, the velocity of propagation as a multiplication. Now, one uh, quick word on the velocity factor. Um, it is a, for the TDR, it is a constant. And as a user, you have to put in this value as a constant. Um, the arrow that you're introducing in your, into your measurement is linear to uh, the arrow in the, in the velocity. That means if your velocity is 10% off, your calculated distance will be 10% off. Now, on XLPE cable, a very common value is 78 meters per microsecond, which is around 255 feet per microsecond in uh, non-metric units. And XLPE has uh, the, the phenomenon that the, the uh, range of these values is not very big. The reason is the, uh, the velocity is affected uh, mainly by the material of the main insulation and to a secondary degree by the geometry of the cable. So the, the velocity is a function of the material. Now, um, the XLPE all around the world, whoever makes medium voltage uh, cable or even high voltage cable, the PE compound is supplied by only one company as of now. There's only one company left that is supplying the basic PE compound that the uh, cable manufacturers are then turning into the XLPE and the tree retardant XLPE and whatnot. And so you expect not much of a stray in these values because the basic materials is the same. So that band is kind of narrow what to expect in terms of the velocity. On EPR, on ethylene, propylene, rubber, that is kind of, if we're talking coffee, the XLPE is kind of your Colombian roast, a nice pure coffee while the EPR is a blend. It is a blend of multiple polymers with filler materials and additives, and there's multiple manufacturers of these base compounds. 
So first of all, EPR is an inferior insulation material compared to XLPE. It has more losses and so forth, and is more polar in tendency. So you expect the velocity to be less because the more you can polarize the material, the slower this factor will get. So, um, and because the, the basic compound can vary, you expect a much higher variation um, on the EPR with the velocity. And PILC, because that is a paper in layers wrapped around as insulation, but the main insulation material is oil, which is a liquid, this can be polarized even better. So you expect PILC cables to be much slower than solid dielectrics. So keep that in mind. Now the challenges for the arc reflection method. Typically long cables, this is very much understandable. You're sending out, first of all, measurement pulses and a high voltage pulse. And a cable, a cable has always losses. So the pulse loses energy, which is called attenuation. It's a dampening effect. And there is something called dispersion, which is a widening in the pulse. So the bandwidth gets uh, wider. And uh, so that means the longer these pulses are traveling down the cable, the less, the, the, the more diminished they become. So at a certain point, there's nothing left. So maybe the high voltage pulse could travel a little bit further and still ionize the air gap or whatever and, and get the fault to flash over, but there's nothing left of the measurement pulse of the radar. So there is a natural limit by physics for this method. Then of course, very high resistance faults. If you, if you have more than 32 kV in ignition voltage or breakdown voltage, you have a problem. And then as I said, whenever the second conductor is missing, which brings you to unjacketed cables, because if there's corro uh, portions of corroded neutral, and the TDR cannot, the pulse cannot propagate any further, you are blind, so the method does not apply anymore. And then, uh, PILC cables and MIN cables. PILC is paper insulated lead covered, it's a cable construction, and pretty much a similar, very similar uh, uh, thing is uh, MIN, which is mass impregnated non draining, which is uh, almost the same in PILC, specifically the insulation is very similar, it's laminated insulation. Also typical pipe type cables are of that category because it's also laminated cables. So there you're limited by the cable construction and I will go into details in a second and by the ignition uh, of, the, of the arc. So now when we're talking about fault locating on PILC, what are we talking about here? It is pretty much the uh, the difference between laminated insulation versus extruded insulation. Extruded is solid dielectric, XLPE and EPR, and laminated is of a con completely different type of construction. Now, the design parameters are also much different. Uh, if you compare this, for instance, on solid uh, cables, on solid dielectrics, the insulation resistance is typically uh, much higher than on tilt cables as a design parameter, and the breakdown voltage on new uh, cables is also much higher. Let's say on XLPE, a thousand uh, volts per mil, um, and the design stress is typically 50 volts per mil in distribution and 250 volts per mil in transmission cables, while on PILC, you have a design stress of uh, 35 volts per mil uh, across the insulation. But as soon as a fault happens, this situation that the solid dielectric has kind of the higher parameters is completely inversed. So after a fault happened, uh, the solid dielectric typically is only in the kilo ohm range and maybe in the low meg ohm range for the fault resistance. And since it's an air gap, a pinhole fault, there's nothing less than air or a carbonized path you only have 25 volts per mil as the breakdown strength there. While in PILC, you have oil. So you have to deal with the breakdown strength of oil. So the resistance is much higher and the breakdown strength can be much, much higher. And this is pretty much what the challenges for the ARM method are uh, based on. First of all, you need high enough voltage to make the fault flash over, which is uh, oil in, in PILC and air in XLPE. You have to have the splash from the main conductor, from the center conductor to the uh, neutral. 
you have to have enough energy to actually create a spark and then develop it into an arc and sustain the arc for a few milliseconds to give the TDR time uh, to uh, uh, reflect off that arc. So that is the difference between just ionizing the air and first of all, vaporizing, displacing, and then ionizing the oil in the paper cable, which means because it's laminated in layers, it's the oil in between those layers, which adds drastically to the, to the breakdown voltage. And then you need a TDR that is able to be adjusted for these differences. So what works on XLPE cable typically has problems on pills because of this ionization time and the vaporization time. So you need to be able to adjust the trigger. And that brings you to the problem that on XLPE uh, cables, the faults are typically between 7 and 12 kV in breakdown voltage, mm -hmm. typically not, not higher. While on pilt cables, even on 13-8 pilt cables or something like that, or even lower, you can have a breakdown uh, a flash over voltages, ignition voltages of 15 to 30 kV. So it's really high. The energy, the more energy the thumper has, the better it is to cable fault locate on tilt cables because joules means, as you can see, what seconds. And uh, that means if there's a time component. So the more energy you have at the same voltage, you will burn, you will create the arc for a longer time. And then you have a various uh, methods to change the trigger. Uh, some raters, sophisticated raters, have an automatic adjustment for the trigger delay, or you at least can manually adjust it, or you use what's called, that is a very powerful feature actually, a raider that has a multi-shot feature, which in conjunction with the arc reflection method is called arm slide, and the TDR does not just fire one pulse, it's firing a pulse train to uh, record 15 pictures. And typically what you see on the screen, if you have an arm slide shot, the first three or four pictures, you can see the arc is still developing and it's an unstable pictures. And then you have a few very, very, very good measurements and you can pick the best one. So you're not reliant on the, on the one chance, you know, shooting it and hitting it right there. So you have 15 chances to get it right. Now, what are the alternatives if the arc reflection method does not work? The first transient method we want to talk about is ICE. ICE is still the method below 32 kV because it uses capacitor discharge. Um, again, our little diagram here. Now you can see the TDR is not in the active mode anymore. It is in the passive mode, which means it records just a wave shape which is a transient recorder. So it only receives signals and it's showing you on the screen what it receives. It's not actively pulsing into the circuit. Um, and on the coupling device, typically is Rogowski coils or on a, a, a more portable systems, it's just normal CTs. So, um, so those CTs, this is the nice thing about the ICE method, um, these CTs or the Rogowski coil is in the ground path of the circuit. That means you decoupling um, a current from the high voltage return. That means the CT or the Rogowski coil does not have to be isolated for full voltage. So you can get away with like a very low insulation class CT, which is fairly inexpensive. So it is uh, the ICE method is relatively easy to add on larger, on a, on a, like on intermediate size systems, portable dual stage uh, thumbers or uh, van mounted systems. What is going on with ICE? The trace, when I'm going through this, you can see an uh, example trace on the right. ICE stands for impulse current equipment or sometimes people say impulse current envelope. The hardware configuration, as, as we just saw, you saw it is a capacitor discharge mode. The radar is purely passive, and there is no arc reflection filter. Your coupling device is a, um, is a CT. What you do is you charge the cap up, and you discharge it into the cable. You will flash over the fault, and you will create a so-called traveling wave. Now, a traveling wave is a, a steep front wave that has both 
voltage components and current components that is traveling away in both directions from the fault. Now on ice, you are decoupling the current. So ice is current decoupling. Um, and what you pretty much do here is you wait for the traveling wave uh, go back and forth. And because of the losses on the cable, this uh, wave, as you can see, is dampening out. And then you measure the distance to the fault over one period of the insulation. This has to do with when you do the current decoupling, uh, how the current component of that wave is propagating. Because if it if it goes if it travels away from the fault, the thumper, the, the capacitor discharge switch is still closed, so the thumper is shorted. The fault, the arc is still burning, so that is uh, a short. So this is why the distance to the fault is one period of the oscillation of the current there. You have to subtract your length because the oscillation is traveling into the back into the equipment and the reflection point is the so-called foot point of the capacitor which is all the way into your equipment including your for instance cable drum measurement leads or whatever so you have to subtract the leads to get a fairly accurate measurement and then you set your cursors in a way that you set the peak to peak like this you choose a nice oscillation and the distance to the fault in this picture here is the distance between those two peaks. Now be aware there's a problem with ice here, which is uh, related to the ionization time, which I will show you in a second. And the application for ice is now typically wherever the arm, wherever arm is not working, long cables, it's fairly effective, unjacketed cables, you get a uh, you can get uh, good results. And of course, PILG. On PILG, it is mainly to the quality of the arc because you ignite an arc that is uh, burning very stable at a, at a uh, nice high voltage. So you get a better trace when you use the ICE method on, on PILG. Typically, you can, you can pretty much say ICE works very well on PILG cables, while ARM works mm, okay on shorter PILG cables and not so good on longer PILG cables. Now the distance to the fault, as I said, is the distance between those two peaks. So be a, this is another uh, real world trace where the cursors have not been set yet. Uh, do never put the cursors over the first oscillation because there's this effect. This is an extreme example. You have the ionization time of the air. So the steep front of your cap discharge is traveling into the fault. And now the air gap has to be, I or the oil gap has to to be ionized first. And that time delay can be, as seen here, extreme. Like on the very left, you see the cap discharge, and then it takes like a while until the oscillation actually starts. And then you have to find a nice oscillation there um, to put your cursors. So be aware of the, os uh, of the ionization time. Um, never use the, the first wave and try to find a, a stable oscillation maybe further into the deep the, the dampening part, the attenuated part, to get two nice peaks. Also, as you can see on the distance here on this trace again, to make this work, you have to set your transient recorder, your TDR, to approximately five to ten times the cable length to get a, a nice picture of the oscillation. What's also recommended on the TDR settings part is that you take the gain up because the signals that you couple with the CT out of the high voltage return, return are typically uh, less lower, less intensity than the arc reflection method. So you need more, you typically should have more gain on the ICE method. Now we're getting into the, so that is pretty much what you have for the flash overs uh, uh, for faults on below 32 kV. Now we're going above 32 kV. And the general comment again, this can typically not be handled with just normal off the shelf thumpers because the cap discharge is not available above 32 kV typically. So right there, you cannot use cap discharge. So any method, which is arm and eyes are out of the picture immediately. So what can you do? Do you need like super sophisticated equipment? No, you do not. You get away with, um, you need a sophisticated uh, thumper to do that, um, and one that has more capability than 32 kV, but not on the discharge, on the cap discharge. What you do is you are exploiting 
the cable's physical parameters, which is mainly the capacitance. And I gave you like the, the principal construction of a cable here. It's a concentric symmetrical connection uh, construction. You have some material. This epsilon here is uh, called permittivity, which is uh, uh, the dielectric constant of the material. And um, so the capacitance here is mainly dependent on the length, and um, which is which is important in this case. So you're using the capacitance of the cable. In terms of uh, equipment, this method that you can apply now is called DK. And instead of using a cap discharge, you're using, surprise, a very, uh, you know, well-known traditional function, which is a high pot. So you're using the high pot function of your thumper, which is typically on portable or regular truck mount systems, 40 kV and on integrated test vans up to 80 kV. So what are you doing there? You're using the high pot function to actually charge the cable, and I will go into details in a, in a few seconds. The radar is like an ice in the transient mode, in the passive mode, which is which why DK is also a transient method. And this time you're not decoupling the current portion, you're decoupling the voltage uh, component of the traveling wave. and and because of that, you need to decouple from the high potential from the center conductor. So you need um, uh, uh, more expensive equipment to do that because you need a capacitive voltage divider that is isolated for the for the voltage that you're actually uh, applying between center conductor and and the ground. So this is why you don't have many thumpers on the market that have DK. Ice is fairly um, straightforward to integrate, but DK is not. It, it needs more know-how. What are you doing? You're using the high pot to charge the cable up. As soon as you reach the breakdown voltage or ignition voltage, the fault is flashing over and you have a traveling wave, and now you're decoupling the voltage with the capacitive voltage divider. You're getting an oscillating trace. Again, it looks a little bit different, but it's the same. Because you're decoupling the voltage now, uh, the propagation of that component of the traveling wave is a little different because the, the thumper now, when the, when the voltage wave comes, propagates away from the fault to the thumper, that is now a, a very high impedance situation. Why in ice, the discharge, the cap discharge is still closed, it's a short. Uh, on DK, this is kind of an open, so the wave gets reflected back. So to get your distance to the fault, again, you're taking one period of the oscillation, but in this oscillation, twice the distance to the fault is contained. So you have to divide this measurement by two to get the distance to the fault. Again, you have to subtract the test leads because the reflection goes into the equipment, and on uh, DK, it's preferred to use the zeros because you get a more uh, a, a better measurement if you use the zeros. And the DK is the method typically used on transmission line cables or subtransmission, everything that is typically more than you can address with cap discharge. And of course, on, on any cable that has a fault that is higher resistive and higher voltage than 32 kV. And this is, again, a little bit bigger, the real world trace. So you see the measurement cursor to cursor. Sophisticated uh, TDRs are, sub are dividing by two automatically, or you have to do it manually. But don't forget to subtract the, um, the cable, the test leads, because the wave is, again, getting back into your, uh, uh, where, the, where, the, uh, where the high pot pretty much is, your high voltage source. Now, please keep in mind why, uh, or use DK only on high voltage uh, faults, because there's the, the reason why. If you just use DK on, on at lower voltages, I mean, the method works, but uh, it's not usable, it's not sufficient, because you do not have enough energy. You're using, remember, you're using the cable kind of as your thumper. You're using the cable capacitance like you use the cap discharge, the capacitance of the cap discharge on ice and arm. So you need a sufficient voltage because 
the electric energy, as you can see there, goes with the square of the voltage. And I gave you a very, you know, standard example. If you have a five, four mile long cable and that has um, 0.25 microfarad per mile, so it makes an easy number, which is one microfarad. Um, and you, the, the fault needs 65 kV to flash over. You charge the cable up with your high pot to 65 kV, and you get an energy that is 2,100 joules. It's a little more, 2,112, uh, you know. I did the calculation correct, but I rounded it because the, those 12 joules are not important. It's the, the magnitude that is important here, which is a, a substantially large size thumper. 2,100 joule is, uh, is it's a, a very nice energy. Now, if you would put, if you would do a fault location on the same cable and the fault is only 10 kV and you attempt to use DK, you only get 50 joules. That is below any audible or, or anything. So this is not usable because the surge energy is not high enough. So DK is exclusively a technique for high resistance, high voltage, high ignition voltage faults. Because of that very reason, you need the energy. Now, another transient method um, that you can use on, for instance, pill cables, uh, it's very nice. That is uh, limited, it stands a little extra. Uh, it's limited to 20 kV, it's a fault conversion technique. Um, and uh, may, some people may know the, the regular fault conversion, just the normal burning, which was invented for pill cables or mint cables. Uh, so you use a burner a high voltage burner that can, that can drive sufficient current after you ignited the arc and you want to carbonize the laminated insulation. You want to carbonize the oil to create a lower resistive path to then use the arc reflection method. Now, if you combine the burner with a TDR, which is not that easy because, again, the TDR here is in live mode. It's actively pulsing into the circuit so it needs to be protected and separated by a device. And so you have a separation device there as well. And in some cases also a, a booster um, to make the, um, the arc burn nicely. But you use the burner as long as your fault, initial fault resistance or ignition voltage is less than 20 kV. You in initiate the arc, you keep it burning and you're burning down the cable until the TDR which is coupled into the circuit, uh, suddenly displays uh, as the, the fault trace, the red trace, with a significant V-shape, like on arc reflection, and you see where the position of the fault is. This method is an automated method. So the TDR takes a low voltage trace first, then the burner starts, and as soon as a certain impedance threshold is met, and, and you see a, uh, a V-shape or the, the uh, algorithm is measuring a low enough resistance, the burning will stop automatically. That allows you to minimize actually the burning time. So that is a very nice method and it's a live method. So you will start with a blue trace and I can show you one example. This is uh, taken in uh, one of our facilities on a, on a uh, pill cable, on the demo cable. And you see there's a blue trace, and then you start the method. Technically, um, I didn't have a video available, but if you, would, if you would show a video of this, you start with the blue trace, you will start with the red trace, which is on top, and as soon as the arc is ignited, you can see the resistance go down, 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 so the red trace starts to fluctuating all over the place at the fault location, and it becomes lower and lower and lower until you have the very pronounced V-shape. So this is where your fault location are, where your fault location is. Now we're getting to the end. Uh, I just want to mention the bridge method. So whenever you cannot use ARM uh, or the other methods are not as suitable or you just don't have the equipment, you can always have a bridge addressing a certain type of low resistance fault and a certain type of high resistance fault uh, on, for instance, very long cables. Uh, where you don't have the ability to charge the cable or whatever, and the bridge can can address these very specific faults. So, for instance, typical leakage faults, so where you don't really can create an arc, um, the 
high voltage bridges are typically limited to 10 kV, so you ha only have 10 kV available. But if your cable is very long and the arc, uh, the arc reflection method does not work, you might have a good chance. Keep in mind, this is pre-location only. You cannot pinpoint the, the fault location uh, with the bridge, so you are, uh, you know, limited to a typical um, uh, TDR comparable accuracy. And you always require two identical conductors. If you only have like one cable and the other two legs, uh, if it's a three-phase system, are not available, you're dead in the water. You cannot use this method. Um, what the, a typical modern high voltage bridge applies is the so-called voltage drop method. So you're using the, uh, you're exploiting the fact that you can make a comparison by measuring the relationship between uh, voltage current and then effectively the resistance between uh, before the fault and after the fault. And uh, your bridge is adjusting. Uh, it's one, it's one leg of the bridge. And uh, there you can get uh, the distance to the fault. So I gave you two uh, connection diagrams. Keep in mind, if you need more accuracy, you always need two auxiliary wires, two auxiliary cables. So the sheath fault, for instance, on top, there's also a configuration uh, possible, like in the bottom, where you use the additional phase to get more accuracy. But those two pictures, it's just very briefly, show you that the bridge is able to do two different types of uh, location. You can have a sheath fault, which is a jacket fault, shield to ground through the jacket, or you can have, uh, you can have a core huh? to shield fault uh, from the center conductor to the, uh, to the shield. can also be um, fault located with the bridge. Um, so that is pretty much it for that method. So the bridge applies whenever arc is not available or when, you, when the cap discharge may not work, when you have very long cables. As long as you are within the parameters of the bridge, um, it, it is an effective method. Um, and as everything, keep, uh, keep in mind, fault location is a toolbox. You have to use the right method for the fault in front of you and not for some other fault. And um, in some cases, the bridge works. In some cases, it doesn't. In some cases, the cap discharge works. In some cases, it doesn't. So as, a, as an overall uh, summary, again, we have the classic art reflection method, which is the industry standard, because the cable networks are moving more and more from PILF to, uh, uh, extrude, uh, uh, to solid dielectric. And it's a very good method for the for addressing the air gap, the pinhole fault. Uh, then you have the uh, the cap discharge method uh, with the ice below 32 kV. You have the DK above 32 kV, and you have the arm burn below 20 kV, and you have uh, the bridge methods. Also, just very briefly, I don't have a slide for that. Um, there's a method before I talk about the products, just real quick. Um, there's a method called DK plus it's exclusively available only in cable test vans it is a further development of the DK method that you saw um, let me actually go back so you have this in mind again the DK method this is a transient method now the thought was can we turn this into a like the can we turn the DK method like we did the burning from a transient method into a TDR method. So the TDR is active and the DK plus is actually this method. It is a method available up to 80 kV because it's in the test van available. And what you do is you, you use an additional capacitor, a four kV capacitor, and of course a coupling device, a, a, a filter. Once the traveling wave is initiated and you have the fault the arc burning at the fault location, you detect that there is this voltage collapse happen. You couple the radar on with this uh, additional 4 kV cap discharge, so you need a thumper that has an auxiliary stage that is 4 kV to stabilize that arc, and then you use it like the arc reflection method. So the DK plus, which um, I don't have a slide here, I didn't find a trace on that, but it looks like an arc reflection uh, picture, like one of these pictures, 
it doesn't look like a decay picture because you take the measurement with an, a reflection, with a reflectometer, a TDR, off and a burning arc, but you use the decay physics to get the fault to break down. So um, on the very high resistance, high voltage faults, you have a more sophisticated version of the decay available. Now, it's very briefly only on the products. So a, 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 a thumper from our end that has the ICE method built in is the ST16. It's a high energy dual stage machine uh, integrated, as you can see. So your uh, high voltage source, TDR separation device are in one enclosure. Uh, the radar is also at the same time your user interface. It's very easy to use the E-Tray. Uh, the interface is called the E-Tray. It uh, steps you through the process. And on the ST16, actually, you have the ICE available. The little brother is the newest iteration of the Easy Thumb. It has the same interface. I just put it here to illustrate. It's a much smaller system. I mean, that picture is not to scale. Uh, but it's a much smaller system, same interface but it doesn't have any of the transient methods. However, the very, the very low voltage version, the, the recent, that was recently released, the two-stage version, has some uh, burning capabilities that is um, um, uh, not, not too bad. It's like 100, close to 100 milliamps. Um, on the very right, you have the SWG3500, which is a, an um, older but a robust system. You have the three components separately. It also has the ICE method built in. And then you have in the middle the SPG40, which is considered the most uh, sophisticated thumper that you can have available in the North American market because it has all of the methods built in that we just talked about, including DK. It is a 40 kV system with 32 kV cap discharge. Uh, and uh, the radar is on top. So it's in, in this case, it's not fully integrated, the radar is, is separate. And then you have the high voltage bridge, um, uh, or one high voltage bridge, which we're still making as a manufacturer that has the voltage, that applies the voltage drop method. So with this, uh, just fairly briefly to show you what's available, um, also one more word on the, on the test vans, we're also building uh, integrated test vans, and here you see the, the high end version of it, a, uh, it's called the Centrix 2, and that has all these transient methods and even more. There's even more. There's IS plus, there's IFL uh, loop on, loop off, and the DK plus um, that is all built into the, the cable fault location part of those test vans uh, uh, as well. And DK and DK plus are available up to 80 kV here. So that is the end of uh, my presentation. And now I give uh, the control back to, um, to Sarah. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. Great job. Uh, at this time, the webinar is officially concluded. We're going to take about 30 minutes to answer any questions that you have. We'll get to as many as we can. If you do have questions, again, if you could please submit them right now on the right-hand side in the Q&A box. We have a actually a, a cable expert panel today ready to answer your questions. The panelists consist of our presenter, Robert, as well as Henning Ochen. He's our product manager out of our Valley Forge office on our cable product side. And then we also have Jason Salchek. He's an applications engineer for cable diagnostic, diagnostics and fault location. Now, for those who are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple minutes to provide your feedback so we can, can continue to improve these future webinars. Uh, again, a copy of the presentation will be emailed to everyone in the next few days, as well as a recording of the session will be available on our website. You can just go to megacom backslash webinars in the next week. You should be able to see it there. Our webinar page also contains the schedule for all upcoming webinars as well as recordings of all previous webinars. Uh, we've already got quite a few questions that have rolled in and I apologize in advance. I'm in the midst of a pretty severe thunderstorm right now so you may hear some background noise. Uh, the first one was actually a comment that came in that I think is worth sharing. It's from Craig. It says, uh, there are two companies manufacturing XLPE, Borealis, and Dow. So thank you, Craig, for sharing that with us. Another one came in, and this one I'm going to throw at Henning. So Henning, if you could unmute your line and be ready. Um, you talked about the breakdown voltage for XLPE versus PILC. 
but how does that differ from the breakdown voltage of the terminators for those different cables? That's from JB. All right. Well, uh, the difference in breakdown voltage between extra P cable and P, P cable is uh, purely the type of insulation material that has different properties. Or in case of a fault, like uh, Robert was saying, the the air versus the oil. Now, depending on the, what kind of terminations you have, you have a similar situation. If you have uh, uh, solid dielectric terminations, then you would expect a similar behavior like you have on uh, on XLP cable. But if you have oil field terminations, like you might have on older equipment, uh, then uh, it it will, they will react very similar in terms of having failures like your 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 pill cable has, or even worse because there are some terminations that have a quite a bit of oil extra oil, excessive oil in them. So the more oil you have, the more difficult it in the end it will get, and the higher your breakdown voltages will get to to find a fault like this. Thank you. Uh, I've got another one. I'm going to throw this at Robert. Uh, Robert, this is from Gary. Gary asks, did you say that XLPE is now better than EPR? This thinking comes from after 50 years of XLPE failures and opinions that EPR is better. Okay. Um, I uh, I can answer that. And Henning might want to chip in on that on top of it because, you know, He's a doctor of science and a chemist, so he knows all the details on that. Um, what I meant with this is, in terms of pure dielectric properties, XLP has the better dielectric properties than EPR. Uh, this is also the reason why all the high voltage cables are typically made, the transmission cables, with XLP. It has less losses uh, and a better permittivity. Now, uh, EPR is, as I said, is a, is a compound. Uh, it has one advantage that I, is very popular in the field, which is its mechanical properties, because it's much more flexible than XLPE. But overall, XLPE is the standard installation um, all over the world. And um, when you say like uh, 50 years of uh, failures, that has to do with um, the generations uh, of uh, PE cable that was uh, that were created initially the first uh, plastic insulations they came up in the in the late 40s until then it was all pilk and quite also a few uh, belted cables in terms of construction and they went through various generations of this PE uh, because uh, the first thing was the extrusion process uh, was not good there's a few vintages um, that had uh, uh, big problems and then this water treeing problem came up. Now this is pretty much addressed by what's called nowadays TRXLPE, which is tree retardant, where they added uh, inhibitors into the uh, uh, crosslink compound to uh, slow down the water treeing by a great deal. So, and that was introduced in the 80s. So I would say anything that you put into the ground or have put into the ground since the 90s uh, does not show this um, uh, this great deal of water treeing anymore. And uh, EPR, it's more popular in North, on the North American market than uh, anywhere else in the world. And um, as I said, it has some mechanical advantages, but overall XLP is the, the dominant insulation uh, material and has the better dielectric uh, properties. And uh, if Henning wants to add to this, um you 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 uh, you explained it very well and very uh, comprehensive so uh, uh, you know initially people liked it like like what we're saying because of the easier uh, installation process of this cable it's a little easy a little fle more flexible a little easier to bend uh, and also initially it had a, a, a maybe a better resistance against the uh, water ingress but with the XLP uh, T, uh, TR with the T return, really, there is not a whole lot of difference anymore. 
And also, just to be sure about, uh, EPR cables can also develop water trees. Uh, this is very well documented. And so uh, I think really for typical URD installation, the big advantage is really the, the easier way to install the cable and it's more more convenient to install it. That's one of the, the big big advantages of this cable for 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 companies. Thank you. Awesome guys. I've got another one. This one I'm gonna toss at Jason. This is from Jim. He asks how can we get an accurate distance to a fault if we have unjacketed cable without concentric because it's an because it's in conduit and has rusted away. We mainly use the arm technique. Uh, that's a, a very difficult situation to find yourself in uh, because you need you need two parallel conductors, of course, for the arc reflection to work. Um, if your concentric neutrals are corroded away, you no longer have that condition. Uh, and the even more difficult scenario is that you're in a conduit and you can't get to ground, so it's very difficult to even get a uh, any kind of reflection or anything going on, any kind of breakdown. So when you find yourself in a situation like that, in conduit especially, it becomes very difficult to find the fault. Um, you can try these alternative methods, something like the, the ICE method might might be functional for you. Uh, if the voltage is at all able to find its way back to the thumper, you may be able to, to get some kind of distance on that. Alternatively, with just the low voltage TDR, you can uh, do that and see where the the end of the cable is, and if it comes up shorter than you expect, that that's probably a good indication of the fault, especially if you can compare it to your adjacent two phases. Hopefully, they're in good shape. Um, just basically looking for any differences on the low voltage TDR. But if you can't get it to flash over in a conduit like that, it, it's a very difficult scenario. Uh, I don't know if Robert or Henning would like to uh, add on to that in any way. Um, I could I could just add to this um, uh, before Henning gives his like ultimate answer. Um, I could add to this that in the in the practical application, you probably have to um, uh, patch it together the best way you can. So you you start using the arc reflex uh, arc reflection method, and you try to find if you have corroded neutrals at all. Not every unjacketed cable has the neutral corroded completely away. Uh, last year I was on a cable in Arizona that, that was abandoned for a while already, but we got good results with the arc reflection method because there was still enough strands on the concentric left in the, and was were not corroded away to make the method work. If there is a, a break in the two parallel conductors principle, uh, you could try going to the other side uh, try it from there, and hopefully the fault is is uh, visible then, and not in between another patch where um, the neutral is corroded away. Um, or you just you just um, have to fall back to the 1970s sometimes, and uh, and just thump and try to find it just with thumping without doing the radar based prelocation. Yeah, I think I, I think that's uh, you know. The worst scenario you just described, if you have no, if you have a long patch of co of uh, neutral corrosion or the neutral is is basically dissipated, then you you only and you have water in the, in the pipe, uh, then you know the uh, the thumping might be a a good way because it will thump to ground, it will thump to the water, so you will get a bang out of it, and and then you just use a, a a standard pinpointing device and and you should be able to uh, to find it however you you obviously you have to walk the entire cable if it's the wrong cable so it's pretty cumbersome that is a you know the situation on the one side you you want to protect the cable you stick it in a in a conduit but if it has bare concentric then obviously it it is comp Constantly underwater in certain in certain locations, which which really creates this this issue. Um, on the other side, this is the worst case that we talked about when it's all gone. If most of the time you will see it, you have corrosion, but you have maybe in one spot enough corrosion that space you open open neutral, and like Robert was saying, then you can typically find it from from one or the other side. 
And uh, I mean, I had one situation where I had an open from both sides, so I had a segment of that cable that we could not take a look with the TDR into, uh, but we at least it eliminated a good portion of that cable from from needing any fault locating attention. So we knew exactly which section was left where we had to do conventional fault locating with a thumper and a pinpointer. So that's always a a option uh, in in a case like this. Awesome. Henning, I'm going to throw another one at you. This one comes from Chris. He's asking, if a fault cannot be detected using an LVTDR, do you recommend conditioning the fault using a burn option on a VLF before going to an HVTDR? Well, it, you know, it, burning, uh, again, typically I say burning should be only done on paper cables. Normally, you don't want to do burning any burning on on uh, on solid dielectric cable XLP or EPR <clears throat> because you can you know a, a real mess can occur when you do that because the, the actually insulation material can catch on fire and burn stop burning okay so you're not you're not uh, really converting to a carbon path like you do on paper but you're really basically burning the material off and and that's normally not not too helpful the the, the burning in 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 that situation would be i think your last resort uh, if you had maybe an aluminum conductor to burn the conductor open because that would give you then a clear indication on the TDR again because you have an open open circuit so I would I would consider this as my my, my last option if you have a low let's say a, a low resistance fault that is not flashing over um, that uh, is is not uh, uh, basically being picked up by the TDR because for the TDR it's a little bit too high in resistance already <clears throat> Uh, that type of fault, uh, you know, on a that is if it's a three-phase or two-phase circuit, that is exactly the best application for a bridge technique. Okay, if you because this is really for the non-flashing faults, low resistance faults that you cannot find with any other method. The bridge method is a great method. However, like Robert was saying, you need at least two uh, two uh, two conductors, or the best is actually three three uh, conductor circuits. Um, the sometimes another method to find that type of a fault, which is really not easy, is, especially if it's a single phase cable, then uh, you you uh, you could try to do one thing instead of finding the the fault on the primary insulation. You might be able to find the fault on the sheath. You do a sheath fault location, provided the cable is direct buried, because the sheath fault is a ground fault. And the idea is, if you have enough of a fault that really creates this low resistance fault in the first place, there's probably also damage to the concentric neutral. If the concentric neutral is damaged, it will be a ground fault from between the concentric neutral and Earth. So you can pick that one up. So it's an indirect method to find one of these faults. So uh, those faults will require, like like Robert was saying, you know, you have a toolbox. You, the more tools you have in your box, you you you're better off to to find these faults. So um, uh, there are different methods, and and sometimes you have to try a couple. Before you you will be successful, but typically you will you you there are methods that you can find these faults with. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. All right, Robert, I'm throwing one at you. This comes from Jimmy. Jimmy asks, what system or product do you have for online partial discharge testing? Uh, for online partial discharge testing, well. Um, there's, we have one product that is called uh, the uh, UHF PDD, but um, this is mainly tailored for the for, on the substation side. Let's say PD on termination, switch gear, uh, and and not so much on the uh, on the, uh, the PD measurement on cables, um, because like a proper PD test or PD diagnostics on cables um, should be done as an offline test. Um, how, how, however, uh, the, uh, if you go to the webpage, it's called UHF 
PDD, that stands for Partial Discharge Detector, and you can find the data sheet right there. It's a small little device. But there might be maybe one other comment on that is um, to have an an off an online PD system um, depends what kind of a cable system you have and what you are interested in whether you want to measure cable PD as a single point measurement from one from one end which would be uh, on the long cable basically impossible because of the attenuation and, and dispersion which happens in a very similar way like it does on TDR pulses. Uh, now, if you had a, a manhole system, uh, you know, there are systems where you can basically check the splices for PD on an online system where you basically have a, uh, a CT, in essence, in the return path uh, where the splice is bonded, and you, you keep measuring those continuously. But that is pretty much limited to the area where the splice is, not really the cable PD. So it, it, the, the online test is to look in the cable, and the long cable is very difficult uh, because you you have this problem of dispersion and and um, um, uh, attenuation. Um, but um, I think on you know on transmission cable, that's what people sometimes do. They 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 are more concerned, really only concerned about splices and terminations. So they have permanent uh, detectors in those devices and they they are permanently monitored monitored so that that can be done but on a distribution cable i think it will be very difficult to get a economic uh, system in place that could do a a, a rather long uh, distribution cable on with an online pd test good deal uh this next one's going to jason Jason, this is from Tracy asking, do you know if you have these test bands on the West Coast, particularly in San Diego? So we do have a, a demo van that runs around the country. Right now it's up in the, the northeast part of the country. So it's gonna be a little bit before it heads back to San Diego. Uh, I know we do have some customers out in California that do use these uh, test bands. Um, I can't give you a date on when the demo is gonna be back out there, but if you uh, would just send us an email. Uh, I believe Robert, did you put your email up on the? Yes. So Robert's email is up there. Send him an email, um, and we will make sure that when we set, uh, route the van back out to you, um, we'll make sure that we get it out so you can see it. Okay, and one more for you, Jason. Overall, which methods could be used when the HB system is on, and which ones need shut down to do testing? So all of the methods that Robert talked about today, they are all for when the cable's out of service, de-energized, and made safe uh, before you you touch it, before you work on it. Uh, none of the none of the methods today work with a a cable that's in service. Uh, the only method that I'm aware of that's even remotely applicable is if you have a three-phase uh, delta system ungrounded. We do have a, a device out there. I think it's good for up to 600 volts. Um, that can find you know where your where your ground fault is on one leg of a delta, um, but other than that, everything else that I'm aware of is is for a uh, offline only system. Uh, Robert, do you know if that's for online? Well, there's the only thing that you know is remotely applicable with some TDRs can tolerate some voltage, but this is like this is like for low voltage systems and secondary systems, so. That's it. As you said, like every cable fault location is an offline process. The cable has to be uh, de-energized, isolated.
second section hasn't been isolated. It, it becomes more a problem when you actually want to do fault locating because uh, you have quite a bit of a, uh, let's say, capacitance in these circuits. The wind farm circuits are known for that because they are, uh, let's say, 1,000 MCM, 1,500 MCM cables, and they're long. So uh, you even it's not very scientific, but the the, the experience has proven this over, over basically half a century. When you when you should have some sort of a relationship between the cable capacitance and the capacitance you have in your sample, and that relation that relationship should be about between five and ten to one. So that means if you have a circuit that has five, uh, let's say, microfarad, which is a probably a medium-sized circuit in a wind farm. It's a big circuit for a typical utility application. Uh, so you should have
and it does not have the the arm the integrated arm burning mode which uses the active uh, active TDR. That is a method you will find in the in the test van. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next question comes in from Christopher. Uh, is there a rule of thumb for the cable length for the arc arc reflection uh, fault detection method? And are these tests destructive? And I think I'll, I'll start this one off. Uh, rule of thumb, and I, Henning was talking about this in just the last question with the uh, the wind farms there. The TDR itself will go very far, 20,000, 200,000 feet or, or more sometimes. Um, that's not really the problem. It's being able to discharge all that, um, or having a, a thumper that has sufficient capacitance to charge up that cable and initiate an arc. Uh, with that in mind, we take the uh, the longest piece of cable that you can sectionalize down to the longest one on your your system, and keep that in mind when we uh, go through the purchasing process of buying a thumper, and make sure that we have one that's sufficiently sized to to do that. Uh, if that all is in, in place, then there should, within reason, there shouldn't be too many issues with arc reflection method on the pretty long cables. You know, up to five miles is shouldn't be any problem. Ten miles on some of the bigger bigger units shouldn't be any issue. I know I myself I've found faults at forty thousand feet on on certain cables. Um, and the the second half of the question is are these tests destructive? And generally speaking, no. Um, you're gonna put one high voltage pulse out there. Some people think that in the thumper it's a DC power, uh, DC source from the thumper and the confusion comes from the fact that the thumpers use a DC power supply to charge up the capacitors. But when we actually do this cap discharge method and release that pulse down the line, it's a very short uh, pulse method. It's neither AC nor DC. So you don't experience those trapped space charge effects that actual DC testing would have on your cable. So it is a, an over voltage test. You know, you prefer not to do it, but your cable's faulted. You have to do it. it you have to find the fault somehow. And these tests are very, very gentle on the cable. Also, uh, just keep in mind, if you arc reflect on it, it there's the filter in the circuit, and that filter uh, shapes the energy in the way to elongate the arc. But um, like if you would demonstrate this in indoors, for instance, that's always a nice demonstration. And you uh, uh, charge a thumper up to the same voltage to have the same energy, and you do an arc reflection shot, and you do a, a, a actual thump, a cap discharge without the filter, there's a, a big difference. Like the, um, the thump is like a gunshot that goes off or a rifle shot, while the arc reflection shot is not much more than it sparked a little and it, it snapped, you know, like a, little, like a little clap when you clap your hands. But it's completely two different things. So arc reflection is typically not a problem. This is why you can uh, uh, just to deviate just a little. Why you can arc reflect through your D loops, uh, and this is uh, not not a problem for the transformers. But uh, at the same time, we do not suggest thumping through uh, through transformers for that very reason. The stress and the shape of the pulse is much different, and the arc reflection method is the pre-location. It's like your um, it's like a, a rifle that is on semi-automatic and has a silencer on it, uh, while the thumping is the silencer is removed and you are on uh, automatic uh, with your rifle, um, if you want to think in those terms. So it's different. It's not the same. Well, I mean, if you if you just want to classify the, the, the possible damage you can do doing fault locating, the worst method that there is out there is when when people close in on us on the fault, throwing a fuse in, because that obviously makes all the, the energy available from a substation. So that is you can you if you close in several times on the same circuit, there is a good chance you damage more than you than you bargain for. Uh, the next the next uh, worse application would be just to use a thumper to fault locate because what it means is you have to thump long times to find a fault typically. And I mean there, you know, especially when you go to, you know, some of the uh longer cables or network systems where people there thump maybe half a day or one day on the cable. That is that is really not not 
I mean, you want to limit it as much as possible. And that's really the idea behind using the TDR methods, whether it's arc reflection or ice or, or DK or these methods, because they typically allow you with maybe, I'm not saying one shot, but maybe two or three shots typically to to get an idea where the fault is. And that is the most important thing, that you have a confirmation, yeah, there is a fault, and you have a rough idea at what distance that fault is. And so you don't have to keep something the whole time. That is that is that is really the benefit of these methods. So, but in terms of damage, uh, uh, you know, you have to find the fault. Uh, so, uh, but, but on the other side, these, these methods like, like Robert and, and Jason were saying, uh, due to the fact that you use uh, is a limited energy compared to the substation, and the fact that you limit the amount of thumping uh, or exposure to high voltage surges, uh, it's 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 not really damaging your cable to to uh, to a point where you say, well, I rather not do that because I do more damage than I get benefit from it. No, that would be not that would be not a a, a correct statement. <laughs> Okay, everybody, we've got time for one more question and then we'll have to wrap it up. Robert, this one I'm gonna throw your way. This comes from Ryan. He asks, since EPR materials can vary much more than XLPE, does the breakdown voltage of oil vary as much? Or is the oil breakdown voltage fairly constant? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, you know, to, to <laughs> the first part of the question, is not related to the second part. Like these variations that I described are mainly important for the for the TDR, like uh, that the velocities on EPR vary more than on XLP because the base material is just supplied to all the cable manufacturers from like um, uh, one company. So the EPR is not, there's one main manufacturer, but the other manufacturers are also making EPR and everybody makes their own compounds. So that has to do with the TDR, the breakdown strength. Well, oil uh, oil can have a few, um, uh, you know, aging conditions and 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 damages over time. For instance, uh, just a portion of the oil can be dried out. Or on these mint cables, um, the the mass was not filled in, so so there's like spots that don't have any oil anymore and all of these things, so that can influence the actual breakdown voltage. But as I showed on the slide, it is first of all much higher than solid dielectrics. So you need a, a thumper system with a higher voltage and typically more energy to be successful. And um, it, as, I, as I showed on the slide, you, you can expect breakdown voltages between 15 and 30 kV. So this is what you have to keep in mind when you when you're dealing with tilt cables, and um, the rest. You know, if there's anything to add to that, I would give to Henning um, because he knows these things uh, by far the, the the most. Well, well, really, uh, the, the break there is no significant difference in break that breakdown borders between you know the compound XRP with this EPR they're both both very good for that there are slightly differences sometimes in the uh, in the uh, what's called BIL basic impulse level for instance also tree retardant is better for fighting water trees off for XRP cables but it has a little lower BIL level so that means if you had constantly transients going on your cables that would then you would see a difference in this behavior but but you know, so there's always a compromise. There's no silver bullet here. But but really, it it, it comes down to the the fact that the oil obviously is there in the fault case where there is air in the fault case for the solid dielectric cables, and that really makes the difference in the breakdown voltage because you have oil versus air, and and there is there are sure there are some differences in oil also. But but uh, the differences that Robert was talking about EPR cable, they didn't relate to the difference in breakdown voltages. They purely related to the to the electric or dielectric properties that affect the TDR pictures, okay, and and the attenuation and the and dispersion and also dielectric losses, okay. But it has nothing to do with the, really the breakdown voltage between those two types of solid dielectric insulation. 
um, on the on the oil, I I I know you know there are different type transformer oils, so they have sometimes different breakdown voltages within a certain range, obviously. And I think I'm not even sure whether the cables that are pilk cables, uh, whether there is really a a, a a a distinct difference in in that breakdown voltage of the oils, because paper cables also have a certain you know breakdown voltage when they're new or when they are when they're aged. So I I wouldn't think there is much of a uh, difference in between oils in terms of breakdown voltage. Unless the the oil is contaminated, you have a lot of water in the cable, or that that's a totally different issue. But the oil, as such, I don't think there is there are significant differences. Perfect. Thank you guys so so much. It looks like we're out of time. Uh, I do apologize if we didn't get enough time to get to your questions today, but we've got your information and your questions, and we'll follow up with you offline as soon as possible. Thank you again for attending. We hope to see you again at our next webinar. That's going to be on Friday, May 19th, and it's entitled Best Practices for Performing Dielectric Breakdown Test on Insulating Liquids. Everyone have a great weekend, and please remember to answer this survey. And also be sure to like and follow Megger on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Henning. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.